I think the reason that enablement works and the reason that it's so important as once you see how change can be driven through an enablement team, I think you're you're bought in for life. And so I think really quickly, those other teams that want to be successful in the business realize that if they want to have the business impact that they're ha hoping for, that they're going to actually come to enablement for help with that versus going around enablement. This is Reveal, the revenue intelligence podcast, here to help go-to-market leaders do one thing. Stop guessing. If you're ready to unlock reality and reach your full potential, then this show is for you. I'm Danny Wasserman, coming to you from the Gong Studios. Ladies and gents of the Reveal Sphere, coming to you for this week's episode. It's Wasserman, or is it Sasserman? You never know who you're going to get. Sasserman, I'm not getting a lot of feedback, whether or not people love it or they hate it. So I'm just going to keep it going until I've overstayed my welcome. Sasserman is here, but it's not about me. It's about someone. You guys remember those high school superlatives? I never won one. Desperate still to achieve one. This person has a superlative only this time. It's not from high school. It's from Crunchbase. Kelly Lewis, the VP of Revenue Enablement at High Spot. Recognized by none other than Crunchbase as a 2023 influential women to watch in sales. Well, she's coming to us, and man, what a force to be reckoned with in the world of sales, revenue growth, and enablement. You've probably seen Kelly's name because she is invited to speak on countless panels at all the leading conferences within our space. She's got expertise and passion. She's transformed teams, processes, and strategies. and Ready for this? Notch on her belt. Been part of 18 different M&A activities over her illustrious career. What I love so much about this episode and our conversation together, she really grabs the bull by the horns and talks about where and why and how do L&D get conflated with sales enablement? Why does there oftentimes seem to be an adversarial dynamic between those two different teams and how can we overcome it? Spoiler alert, empathy. Really excited for you guys to learn, absorb, ingest, and internalize all of Kelly's pearls of wisdom. Enough from Sassman, DJ Spin. It's Kelly Lewis. Kelly, welcome. Oh my gosh, Danny. Thank you for having me. Thrilled to be here. This has been a love story in the making between you and Reveal. We need an equivalent of like, when people listen to Dak Shepard's podcast, Armchair Expert, they call them arm cherries. So perhaps over the course of this episode, we'll figure out what revealers are called. But Great. tell us about your original sort of taste or experience with Devin and Sheena about the genesis of you becoming a reveal listener. Yeah, this is a full circle career moment for me. I have to say, I spent most of my career in sales and sales leadership, but I often found myself engaging and working on projects that had to do with bettering our sales team, getting them through big changes and really partnering closely with product marketing and revenue operations. And a few years ago, I was listening to the wonderful Reveal podcast and you had someone on talking about enablement. I did not know what enablement was, had never heard of it. Listened to the podcast, got off, started Googling, immediately wrote myself a new job description, <laughs> went to our chief revenue officer, our CMO, VP of product, VP of revenue operations and said, this is how I add value here. This is what I should be doing. And I made a career switch almost instantly. So I owe my career in enablement due to reveal. And so I could not be more excited to be here today. Well, all of the warm and fuzzies are just coursing yeah. through my veins right now. I can't take credit for that episode. So Devin Reed, Sheena Badani, we stand on the shoulders of giants. Thanks for all of your evangelism for the podcasting and the B2B SaaS space. I do want to touch on a topic, Kelly, because you took a bite of the forbidden fruit that is enablement, but you are bringing an incredibly unique backdrop to the profession, having experience, guys, you ready for this? 18 different M&A activities. And typically speaking, in the world of enablement, we don't have the luxury of getting to sit really in the shotgun or even the driver's seat for M&A activity. In fact, we're downstream and can be the collateral damage from M&A. So talk to us about what you went through during the M&A chapters and how the lessons from those 18 different activities have then been parlayed into how you approach, whether it's sales, whether it's enablement or 
the, the collective? Yeah. So I'll say throughout those activities, one of them was an IPO and then they were either I was being acquired or we were acquiring other companies. And I sat mm -hmm. both on the sales side of it as well as on the enablement side. So I've kind of seen it full circle. And one thing I'll say that I think if anyone's going through an M&A transaction or they're experiencing it, especially if you're a seller or in sales leadership, there's a couple of things that will help you get through it. Mm -hmm. One is you have to be part of the change. I think people that survive and do really, really well in these big market events are people that are comfortable with change and willing to jump in, but also heads down on the job you're there to do. So stay really focused on what it is you were hired to do, but also get to know the new company that you either acquired or are acquiring, and then be easy to work with. And when I say that, I don't mean get rolled over, but I do mean really understand and what how to work with people so that they want to work with you and they want you on the team. Those are three things that I've just found over and over in these M&A transactions that if you can follow those three rules and set yourself up that way, you'll be in a really good position. And when you talk about being receptive to change and not in a way where you lose your spine or your integrity totally. or become a doormat, but that there's an affability and agreeability, give us some more concrete or granular examples of are people withstanding the change? Are they prideful in, hey, like I'm the sort of acquiree and we've been successful in spite of you acquiring us. So they are unwilling to oscillate, dare I even say, sort of flex a little bit in how things are done? Or what are the examples when people withstand or push back on the change that inevitably backfire? So I think there's two types of people with change. There's people who see the change and know that they can only control what they can control. Mm -hmm. And those individuals typically see the change and are like, I hope this can be a positive thing. And I'm going to go find the positives. And then there's individuals that sink back and want to go back into the way the world was before and are constantly poking holes in potential things that could happen. And those individuals get distracted from their day job, whether they're in enablement or with whether they're in sales. They're usually not spending the time they need to do on the job they were hired to do. And that just doesn't set you up for success. And so if you can avoid getting distracted, you're in a way better situation. So relatedly to how to survive and even thrive after a major capital event, whether it's an acquisition or an IPO, obviously we're living through different economic times. We're in a downturn, but we are all confident and willing to believe that eventually there will be a recovery. So want to understand when you think about in anticipation of the recovery that we all need to have happen for the sake of our shares and everything going on, but what should whether it's sales, whether it's enablement or the collective of the two, what should they be doing to best anticipate and prepare for that recovery? Because the playbook's going to look drastically different from where we're operating today. I think the biggest mistake that organizations are making right now is they're not thinking about what happens when the market recovers. Mm -hmm. They're scrambling to figure out how to address the challenges of today, which is super important. But as they do that, they often do too much when it comes to enablement. They throw too much at the refs and they're creating distractions. So my recommendation in every leader I'm talking to about this is, hey, pause, do the things you need to do to get through this moment in time, but start thinking towards the future, create plans. What does that look like as you go into recovery? You're going to want to hire and probably pretty quickly. Do you have an onboarding program that scales? Do you have the team structure and organization that you need to scale? And have you built things like competency models that you can grow and scale from? I think there will be a huge difference in companies that succeed and companies that don't succeed based on whether they have a plan in place today for how they go back into growth mode. And when you think about growth mode, the first place my head goes to is headcount. So yeah. most organizations, especially within ops and enablement, as we're overlays to revenue generating roles or engineers, we were very much affected by wide sweeping layoffs. So can we be even more specific? You talk about, okay, you have a bench of candidates who you want to hire, who you've earmarked and put on the short list, or you even have the roles spelled out, the JD's ready to roll. You're just waiting for the green light from finance and HR and people to light it up. Or what does that plan look like when we get down to brass tacks? So there's the magic number. Every sales professional knows about it. Every enablement leader knows about it. You're trying to get your sales and marketing percentage of revenue to that magic number. 
And so I think we've seen a lot of companies divest in certain areas as they try to get back to that magic number. Yeah. But as that revenue grows, they're going to have to scale really quickly. And so what I'm really thinking about with my team and what I'm talking to other customers is how do you support those things really quickly? What can you do onboarding, for example, brass tacks? You should have some asynchronous learning. I think a lot of us, especially in this environment, have been focused on live facilitation for onboarding. That is not scalable when you're bringing in 50 to 100 people or more in a month. And so how do you create learning that can be scalable and can be optimized as things change in the market? I also think about how do you empower your managers and your leaders? When you're hiring new people, you're not just hiring reps. You're oftentimes hiring frontline managers. And they typically have the worst onboarding experience because we don't have customized onboarding for frontline managers. So as you're in this market downturn right now, if you're in tech, spend the time thinking through what does frontline manager onboarding look like? How do you get get them up to speed? So as they're hiring these new teams, they have everything they need to be successful. Amazing. Let's talk about then because enablement has certainly felt the effects of layoffs and divesting of certain parts of the business. It's forced a lot of teams to become generalists. We're all wearing two, three, four different hats more than we were accustomed to or probably what we were hired for. So as you determine, and maybe it's not binary, but talk to us about the decision to build out a team of generalists versus specialists. And I'll add a yeah. two for. So generalists versus specialists is one. And then two would be, does that change when we're in peacetime versus wartime markets? Yeah. One thing I really love about this moment in time, and I'll answer your second question first, is I highly believe being a generalist or uh, my team, we call it utility player in wartime is really important. And I actually think it's kind of exciting. So you'll find for me, I try to put a positive spin on wherever I can. And one thing that this is enabling my team to do is people who were at one point really, really specialized, just knew how to do one great thing. They're now putting their hands in all of these other projects and getting to work with different teams. So when we come out of this, A, their resume's been extremely built up and they can actually understand where they want to go in their career. What part of enablement or l d is most of interest to them? So if you're sitting in enablement and you're struggling because you're suddenly having to be a utility player or a generalist, take this as an opportunity to learn and to grow so that once the market starts recovering, you know where you want to go. Because I do think there is a world for specialists. I think they are highly important, especially in a peacetime world, as you called it. But we're just not there right now if you're mm-hmm. in that. Got it. You talked about L&D. And for listeners out there, I think it's typical or it's tempting to conflate enablement and L&D. So Kelly, from your wealth of experience, what is sort of that church and state separation or do the lines just inevitably blur? Let's start there. So L&D is typically based out of your people organization and they are a group of adult learning experts. And I've noticed throughout my career in talking to our thousands of customers, as well as, you know, us internally, and I've seen it throughout my career, whether I was an enablement or a sales rep, there is a adversarial relationship sometimes between L&D and enablement that I don't think needs to exist. And one thing I've been able to do in this last stop in my journey right now is really partner with L&D. In enablement, we are typically former sales reps. A lot of us have carried the back. And so we have this one area of expertise that most people in L&D don't. But most of us didn't grow up learning about adult learning. We don't understand how the brain works. And so I think if you can look at L&D as a partnership and use them as a centralized resource to understand how to take your enablement initiatives and make them really relevant to your teams, you can actually scale your enablement team to greater heights. And so the challenge I would give to anyone that's in enablement listening to this or anyone who's selling an L&D is actually figure out how you can create a partnership and leverage resources between each other because you're all trying to do the same goal. You're just thinking through it very differently. 
Kelly mentioned, it's worth noting that L&D, which we abbreviate as learning and development, and sales enablement, they intersect quite often. Think of it this way. Sales enablement can be seen or understood as a specialized branch of L&D that focuses particularly on sales-related training support. And a study by Training Industry found that 70, 70% of employees say they don't have a strong enough mastery of the skills needed to do their jobs. On top of that 70%, 87% of executives reported a readiness gap in their organization. Sales employees feel this gap most acutely, and in this case, L&D can really step in and save the day. Sales teams have seen a 30% increase in performance after utilizing the complementary L&D services that overlay sales enablement. That's pretty impressive. So for sellers to survive and thrive in these competitive dynamics, well, L&D could be among many of the saving graces for achieving your desired business outcomes. Let's hear more from Kelly about how you can go and unlock the L&D magic that's right under your nose. And thinking about, you all have the same desired goal. One team, the L&D team, is typically applying theory of yes. adult learning best practices or as former educators, masters in human cognition. There is this theoretical of what good looks like. But as you stated, enablement has the empirical knowledge, the firsthand experience of being in the trenches, carrying the bag to know practically what will and won't cut the mustard. So when you have masters, but then you actually have tacticians, where does the buck stop in that relationship? Or is that the problem? And that confusion is what results into an adversarial dynamic. You know, I think a lot of it is, is enablement likes to break the theory. And I'm guilty of that. So let me give you an example of something we recently did. We realized that there was a need to do manager enablement. We have a large subset of first-time managers leading our sales team, and they are eager to learn, but they just don't know where to start. And so we did a leadership summit here in February, and the way we partnered with l d was really interesting. We took their theory and their coaching models, and we adapted it to the way Highspot, in my case, works and the way our sales leaders need to work. And so there had to be some flexibility from our amazing L&D team um, run by Annie, who said, hey, you know what? We can flex here a little bit on this theory because we understand high spot works differently. Mm -hmm. And so if you can get to a point where L&D and enablement can flex, I think you're going to find a really strong working relationship. I think when there's no flex or there's 100% wanting to own a program versus partnering is where you find that adversarial relationship. Well, when you talk about, I mean, this is the second dynamic where you've talked about people's willingness to bend, right? You had yeah. to bend as part of a capital event, like an M&A activity, or in the partnership with L&D, everyone's got to give a little. Let's go one additional step into okay. the world of enablement playing Switzerland, Always. RevOps, right? I've seen firsthand times when enablement and RevOps are totally simpatico, and then I've seen them just butt heads and be totally at loggerheads with one another. Talk to us a little bit about how you have perfected that tango, knowing how to best partner with a team that we absolutely need, but oftentimes approaches the same goal in a very different mindset or approach. I think it all comes down to empathy. In enablement, we talk a lot about having empathy for our sellers. I think you will never find an enablement leader who doesn't focus with their team on talking about empathy for your sellers. But what about empathy for all the other teams we work with? I think we forget about it sometimes. You know, PMM has a hard job. Revenue operations has a hard job. They're facing different KPIs and goals. And I think if you can focus on having empathy and understanding where they're coming from and what they're trying to drive, you'll find success. So a lot of times I start the conversation with revenue operations. What are you trying to do here? What's your ultimate goal? And if it's to save dollars or Figuring out or digging into what they're really trying to solve for, you can find and marry your goals together. It's when you don't know what they're trying to do and you don't ask the questions. Enablement, we're salespeople too. Like you said, we're Switzerland, but we have to sell a little bit. And part of selling is doing really, really good discovery. And so I ask my teams to hone in on their discovery skills when they're working with these other teams so that they can create the empathy that they need to work together. Well, the quality of empathy in like chicken or egg, are you empathetic, which then leads to you know, wanting to flex more? Do you flex, which then reminds you to be empathetic? 
We don't need to solve for that debate, but it sounds like that has been a cornerstone to your success and winning formula as an enablement leader in one of the most recognized and respected tech companies. If you could, I'd love to hear, obviously you have now amassed a sort of collection of winning hacks, tricks, plays. It probably wasn't always the case that you were so adroit and adept at this. Were there any times when you yourself forgot to flex or you yourself overlooked the criticality of being empathetic and ended up inadvertently stepping in. Any stories like that, Kelly, that come to mind? Oh my gosh, a ton. I think we all have these as we go through our career where we have moments where we feel really strongly about something and we're not willing to flex. Mm -hmm. I think most of these examples that I have in my career are when I didn't provide enough details on what I was trying to do. I think a lot of times we're moving fast, especially in tech. There's not enough time, you think, in your head to slow down and provide the context that's needed. And so I would say whenever I have these moments, it's usually because I didn't provide enough context. So mm. just as the discovery you need to do on the other side, you also then need to provide that same context to whoever you're working with. And sometimes you just forget to do it. It reminds me of a personal story. So I'm in my early 20s and figuring out my way in my career. And I remember talking to my boss and was proverbially pointing the finger at someone else <laughs> and casting blame on someone else. And I even, I think, put my index finger, my thumb up and was pointing. And when you do that for listeners that aren't watching the video, imagine you've got your index finger and your thumb pointing at someone else. And my boss stops me and says, Danny, when you point your finger at someone else, you've got three pointing back at you. And it just reminds me. So your point, Kelly, what did I fail to explain? What did I personally omit or assume? And again, possibly the blame is shared, but it's not singularly on the other person. So I really like that perspective. Oh, I love that story. That's so good. There you go. Well, when we think about, there are countless examples that you've experienced that have informed your successful winning formula. It just sounds, and keep me honest here, but so much of your success and enablement has been this connective tissue, this glue between all the various cross-functional teams that all lead eventually to sales. So does that make enablement the gatekeepers? Does that make them the conduit? And if so, why has no other function been able to become in this hub and spoke so central to unlocking sales? Talk to us about that. Oh my gosh. I could probably count the number of times or I couldn't count the number of times people have said, you're trying to be a gatekeeper. Mm -hmm. And initially, when they start working with enablement teams, I think that's the first reaction is, oh, great, we've got a new gatekeeper here to hold things back that we want to get in front of the sales team. And so I think the reason that enablement works and the reason that it's so important as once you see how change can be driven through an enablement team, I think you're, you're bought in for life. And so it's that, hey, we can either partner really well together and I can help make sure whatever you're trying to drive with the sellers lands, or you can do it on your own and know that it's going to get lost in the hundred other things that everyone else in the business is trying mm -hmm. to do. And so I think really quickly, those other teams that want to be successful in the business realize that if they want to have the business impact that they're ha hoping for, that they're going to actually come to enablement for help with that versus going around enablement. So it's like this forced partnership of it's really, really hard. The reason enablement exists, it's really, really hard to drive change in an organization. It is almost impossible. And that is what enablement does well. Other people don't have that skill set and other teams don't have that skill set. So if you want to drive that change, you've got to go through enablement. Mm -hmm. But they have to learn that I think it takes time to build that trust. And so you kind of have to start small with some projects and then gain that trust over time. And to be able to assume a role as a trusted gatekeeper who can translate between whether it's PMM or product or even the ivory tower of executives, if you sit as this conduit, is it essential? Is it paramount? Is it a non-negotiable that you have to have been a seller to be able to articulate both languages because the vernacular of the ivory tower is not necessarily the same as the field. And oftentimes those can get lost in translation. So is that a precursor to you hiring anyone on your team? Oh, I love that question. That is such a hot topic right now. No, 
And it goes back to actually what I was talking about with L&D. So my enablement team has previous sellers and they are so important to yeah. working directly yeah. with our field. But we also have, we actually have our own L&D team that we have internally. And those are individuals that understand the frameworks and the theory. And then we have other individuals that are just really good at understanding our tech stack and certain other areas of the go-to-market strategy. And so the way I have organized my team is that none of all three of those parts work together really closely on a strategy versus having a single program run by any it, one individual. So that way we're getting all of those three components when we're delivering to the team. So it goes back to my like generalist versus specialist as well. I think you need a little bit of specialist, but I think the more you generalize your approach, the better. Amazing. So Kelly, we're talking a lot about what could be some inadvertent potholes or pitfalls in enablement, right? Like we don't want to be in adversarial dynamics with RevOps or L&D. We want to be simpatico and empathetic. So let's go one step further. What does good enablement look like? Oh, what good looks like. It's so funny. In enablement, we talk about what good looks like all the time. We're trying to create visibility to what one seller is doing versus another seller to make sure that they understand, you know, what good looks like and how to go in that direction. We don't always talk about it and reflect on ourselves. Like, what does good enablement look like? What does bad enablement look like? And how do you create those behaviors? And so I do this exercise with my team. And the exercise is, what do you want to be known as? Mm. And it's a really interesting exercise because you have to limit it to three things. And in that exercise, you often find that when you understand what it is and how you work, it's actually how you work with others. And so if you've ever done this exercise, I challenge you all to do it. Sit down and be, what do you want to be known as? And if you're in enablement because of the way we think, it typically is how you interact with other people. And I think what that comes down to is doing doing really good discovery, really understanding what is motivating the other individual and working with them to drive those same outcomes. When I think about even my first question, what does good enablement look like? It's so broad. Like, where do you even start? And then the exercise that you ask your team to do, and forgive me because I think I'm going to bastardize and paraphrasing what you said, but what do you want to be known as? Is that sort of the end result? Yeah. Even that is such a broad statement. Like, what do, what do I want to be known as? I don't know, funny guy who's a podcaster who likes food or like, what do I want to be known as professionally? What are some of those guardrails that you help set up so people don't take the prompt in a direction that has no relevant to how they want to be known within high spot? Great question. So part of my prompt is also, we all have superpowers. I believe we all have superpowers and they are things that have gotten us to where we are in our career today. And so if people get stuck and don't understand the prompt and don't know where to go, I say, write down, what are the three characteristics you think you have that got you to your career today, that got you here? What makes you different? What separates you? And The other thing about that is one of the superpowers, what do you bring to the team dynamic that other people on the team don't have? And once you think through those two buckets, it helps you understand what you want to be known as because you're kind of probably already known as most of those and you just have a little bit of a stretch goal. Well, I have to close with this next question. Kelly, what are your three superpowers? Oh, my three superpowers. Okay. My first superpower, I think, is empathy. I think we've, okay. we've hit on that a little bit. Second is dealing with change. I think throughout my career, I found that if I help other people through change, it helps me through the change. And so I just take a stance in, hey, let me go help others and it will help me go through all of the grieving processes that come along with change as well. And then I think my third superpower is I can go at all levels. And so I love getting into the weeds. You put an Excel spreadsheet in front of me, I can go in and do some budgeting. And then I can also think really strategically about where we're headed. And for example, what's our recovery plan? Once the market picks up, where are we headed? And so the fact that I can really quickly jump from different layers, I think are one of my superpowers. Amazing. Well, Kelly, we're looking at the clock right now and the sheer wealth of wisdom that you've shared between, as you said, generalist versus specialist, being the flexible, empathetic compatriot to all these cross-functional teams. We've really done an unbelievable job of synthesizing how people can take 
all of the tools you've provided your team at Highspot and replicate them across their own organizations. As a, as we started the episode, an avid reveal listener, you also know that before we close every episode, there is one question that we ask all of our guests. So here it comes. This shouldn't it be an ambush or a sabotage in any way. But Kelly, before we break, got to ask, if you were to describe sales in one word, what one word would that be? I think it is, oh my gosh, I kind of forgot that you did this. You did catch me off guard. I should oh my have goodness. that. I know. I thought you knew this was coming all along. I know. I know. I should have remembered. If I had to describe, it's being persuasive is really understanding who you're talking to, understanding their motivations, and understanding where they're trying to go. And so I think the word is persuasive. Well, you're clearly someone who knows how to finesse persuasion with empathy. Kelly Lewis, it occurred to me, I wanted to call this out in my opening, hyping you up. But one of my other favorite qualities about you is that you too are also a Colorado native. So I, perhaps I that is something that is just being pumped through the Rocky Mountain air, persuasion and empathy. Well, thank you so much for indoctrinating all of us into what's made you wildly successful and just also sharing a unique level of experience with 18 different acquisitions. That's something that we don't oftentimes get in Reveal on the studio. So that will benefit all of our listenership. With that said, Kelly, I can't thank you enough. It's been a lot of fun hearing about the journey that your life has taken you to becoming the VP of Revenue Enablement at High Spot. Thanks so much. Thank you, Danny. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Reveal. If you want more resources on how revenue intelligence can help you create high-performing sales teams, head on over to gone.io. And if you like what you heard, give us that five-star review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you may listen.